uh, sing songs about how you are you're worthy of worship, um, how you deserve all of our all of our praise, all of our glory, and that's uh, that's a theme that's proclaimed again and again throughout the whole of Scripture. And uh, sometimes we don't really think about that on a day to day basis. We get caught up living our lives and taking care of the various crises that come across our path on a day day to day basis, or the various uh, uh, tasks that we have to perform. We don't uh, think very much about you. Um, and uh, we, as your people, repent of that and pray that you give us the grace to uh, keep you uh, on our minds. But I pray that now as we have gathered together as your people, that we would be able to turn our focus and our attention to you and uh, to give you the praise that uh, you deserve. So please fill us with the Spirit and help us to do that now. I pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Psalm 48.1 says, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. In the city of our God, in his holy mountain, uh, great is the Lord. So let us, the people of God, join together and worship our great God this morning. Please stand as we sing, Worthy of Worship.
Christ will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. The guy who, uh, the man who married us, uh, his name is uh, Steve. Um, I've known him for about three years now. He is a, he's a former cop in Springfield, Missouri. Uh, he's now an ordained minister and a uh, licensed counselor. And I really like Steve a lot. You know, you meet him and you might think when you meet him at first that he's this really gruff kind of guy. And uh, I mean, he was a, a police officer for, for decades, so that might explain that. But the more you talk to him, the more that you realize that he is one of the warmest and kindest individuals that you'll ever have the privilege of meeting. Uh, he has a cop span, but no one's perfect. So he and his wife... <laughs> He and his wife, Berna, uh, have had an important role in my life, uh, in large part because they've had a very important role in my wife, Rachel's uh, life. Rachel became a believer uh, as a teenager when she was 16, uh, and then she went off to college in uh, Missouri State, in Springfield, Missouri. And uh, Steve and Berna, they run a, a coffee shop right next door to Missouri State. It's called, uh, it's called the Potter's House. It's got, a, it's got great coffee, but it's not just a coffee shop. It's also... A, uh, a ministry. It's a way for Stephen Burnett to reach out and, and uh, reach college students for Christ. And Stephen Burnett quickly became Rachel's spiritual mentors. They are uh, instrumental. God used them greatly to grow my wife and the Christian faith. And then eventually, they, uh, after we had met and, and dated for a while and got engaged, they did our premarital counseling. Uh, by God's grace, I, I would say we've had a, a really good marriage, and that's in large part due to godly counsel that they have given us. They really taught us how to communicate well, how to work through conflict. Uh, they are just extraordinarily wise people when it comes to that. So Rachel and I, we're benefiting from older, more mature Christians coming alongside of us and showing us the ropes of how to live the Christian life, particularly the Christian life as married people. And not just by telling us what to do, they've also modeled it for us in their own lives and in their own marriage. And I think that's in large part what the Apostle Paul is trying to get across to the Philippians and trying to get across to us today in our passage. It's, uh, it's easy for us as we're going through life to get knocked off course. Things pop up. We get our minds, as he says here in, uh, in verse 19, we get our minds set on earthly things that don't ultimately matter, that aren't going to last. What we need are godly men and women, uh, role models in Christ to come and help us to stay the course of the Christian life. Let's pray. <coughs> Father, I thank you for all the godly men and women in my life, those who have followed you for, for many years, for decades, uh, those who have grown and become mature in you, who, when you're around them, you can just sort of sense the, the Spirit of Christ at work in them. They have been so instrumental in me growing in the faith. And uh, I pray that we, as your church here at Westgate, your churches um, across the world, that we would take Paul's message to heart here, and he talks about this other places in the New Testament as well, that we would become people who would help each other, encourage each other, that the older and more mature Christians would take the younger Christians and help them to grow in the faith and that we would uh, fulfill what you have designed for your church. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Verse 17. <clears throat> Brethren, join the following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. You have probably heard at some point in your life, you may have even said the phrase, uh, do what I say, not what I do. Uh, I'm a father now. I imagine it's not going to be too long before I say that myself. But I think but the Apostle Paul is saying, do both. Do what I say, of course, but also live the way I live. Follow my example. Uh, now, Paul's not saying that he, in and of himself, as Paul, is worth following and imitating. He's not saying, you know, I am the man. He, he makes this very clear to the Corinthian Christians in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 1, in which he says... Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Yeah. So imitate me because I am imitating Christ. Well, 
you might ask the question, you might be thinking, why didn't Paul just say, imitate Christ, you know, kind of cut out the middle man, you know, a bit. Why, would, why wouldn't, you know, wouldn't that be a little bit simpler? Well, the thing is, I think there's all kinds of answers to that question, but one thing that we should bear in mind is that the Philippian believers, almost certainly no one, no Christian in the city of Philippi had ever actually met Christ in the flesh. Paul had, Paul had experiences, visions of Christ, and we've learned that he spent three years in the desert, and Jesus personally taught him uh, the gospel. But the Philippians, as far as we know, hadn't had that experience, and they probably at this point didn't even have what we now call the Gospels yet. They had uh, tradition, they had world traditions, they had uh, stories passed down about Jesus. And so they knew about Jesus, they knew about what he had done, they didn't have like, a written record yet that, that we have. But what they did have was the example of Paul. They had met Paul in the flesh. And Paul had modeled to them what it was like to live like Christ in the real world. And Paul says to them, imitate me, but I can't be there all the time. Obviously, he's got so many other churches he's concerned with, and at the moment, he's in prison. So he also says, find other godly men and women to imitate. He says, um, note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. So why is this, uh, why is this important? You know, why is he telling the Philippians to imitate him, to imitate other godly men and women? Well, we as human beings learn by imitation, and uh, this is especially obvious when you're when you're talking about kids, right? My my daughter just turned nine, nine months yesterday, and uh, she has very recently developed some new skills. Uh, one of these skills is, and I'm not saying she's going to do this for you. So if you go and do it, and she doesn't do it, I'll be disappointed. But sometimes, if you wave at her, she will wave back, and sometimes she'll even initiate the wave, and it's really cool. And that's something that she's learned how to do, like within the last couple of weeks. Uh, and uh, she learned to do that, of course, by, by imitation, you know, hours and hours of us waving at her, and she's looking at us like, you're stupid. <laughs> finally, she, finally, she picked up on it. She learned, she's learned other skills as well. She has a little friend who's three months older than her. Yeah, Fitz has just turned a year, and uh, Fitz is a little maniac, and he, like, pulls up on everything, and so he can stand, and now he's walking. And for a while, we just watched Ellie watch him. She was just like... <laughs> So last week she started doing the same thing. She's pulling up on tables. She's grabbing things she's not supposed to grab. It's awesome. <laughs> really exciting. Really exciting new phase in our, in our parenting. So obviously, and, and that's how our kids learn pretty much anything, by watching older people, sometimes not even that much older people do things. Oh, well, that's how I'm going to do it as well. Um, but it's not just kids. Like, even adults learn by imitation. That's how we learn new skills. If I ever learn how to work on a car, which is not likely, I'm not going to learn it from working on a, uh, reading a book. I'm probably not even going to learn how to work on cars from like watching YouTube videos. Uh, I'm probably going to have to have somebody show me. And that is how most of our new skills are learned, including, to a large extent, the skill of living the Christian life. So think of somebody right now, think of somebody that you consider to be a godly, mature Christian, someone who is really grown up. And then think about how they how they live out the Christian life in the real world. Think about how they handle stress, right? And what, what's their routine for praying, for reading scripture, for, for practicing the spiritual disciplines? How do they incorporate that into, into their lives? How do they raise their kids? Like how do they how do they deal with discipline issues when those arise with their kids? How do they deal with tragedy? How do they get through tragic situations? What's their attitude? How do they help other people? And, uh, and, there's, and the list goes on and on of different aspects. Um, and it's important for us to have those role models so that we can have a pattern for how we ourselves will deal with those aspects of our lives. Here's another way of thinking about this. We all know that we're supposed to have the fruit of the Spirit. We can probably even name the fruit of the Spirit. The reason I can do that is because I learned a song when I was five, and, uh, and so I can repeat the fruit of the Spirit. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't be able to because... You know, music really helps with that. But, I have no idea why I just said that, I'm sorry. We, uh, we're supposed to have the fruit of the Spirit, but what does that look like? What does it look like to exemplify the fruit of the Spirit in our own lives? Well, when I think about that question, you know, some examples pop into my mind. I think of my dad. I've seen my dad in some really highly stressful situations at work, at church, other places. And I've seen him treated poorly by others, right? How does my dad respond? He gives them, he gives people the benefit of the doubt. He doesn't castigate people behind their backs. He doesn't go behind their backs and talk bad about them. Uh, I've heard him, I've heard my father raise his voice maybe like twice in my life. 
you know, just an extraordinarily patient man. And so when I think about the spiritual fruit of patience, I have an example of my father uh, demonstrating that in the real world under tough conditions. When I think about kindness, one of the fruits of the Spirit, I think about a professor I had in college, uh, Dr. Cadalford. He was actually an economics professor. Um, and he was like one of those guys when you're around, like I was saying earlier, you felt a real warmth about him. He's just somebody that was really good to, to be around. He obviously loved his students. He would take time to stop in the hallway and talk to them. He, his office was, was always open. He was uh, really generous with his time, and he would open up his home to his students as well. We would have a Friday night Bible study pretty much every Friday night during the semester, and he had a great deal of wisdom regarding the scriptures. That was really good for me, too, especially since um, there were parts of college that were very heavy, very difficult times for me, so that was a real mainstay in my life. And so when I think about kindness, I think about Dr. Cadalford, and so on and so forth. Each one of you has examples of people living out the spiritual, the, the fruit of the Spirit, in the real world. It goes without saying that no human example is perfect. Paul himself just said, like a paragraph ago, that he has not yet reached the goal. He still has a way to, way to go. So Paul himself said that. And therefore, no one else is perfect. If you put your hope and trust in a person, you are going to be let down. But even so, even with that said, we were not designed to live the Christian life alone. And, and this is what Paul's talking about in the book of Titus, particularly in chapter 2. He's talking about how he wants the older women to instruct the younger women on how to follow Christ. He wants the older men to get with the younger men, instruct them on living for Christ. The spiritually mature are supposed to get those who are young in faith and help them to grow in faith and love in, in Christ. This, by the way, is... Uh, this is one of the reasons why church is so important, going to church. Um, it's not, going to church isn't something that God wants you to do because that's what good people do. It, you're not going to get, you're not going to go to heaven and get like a perfect attendance report or whatever. Like that's not why, that, that's not why we, we go to church. We go to church because God designed us to need each other. We, um, we need encouragement from each other. Sometimes we need rebuke from each other. And uh, we also need role models, how examples on how to live for Christ in different and difficult situations. We need each other like soldiers in a squad in a combat zone need each other, right? If you go away from your squad, you are a sitting duck. And actually, that's the reason why Paul brings up the importance of having role models, of having examples in Christ, because we are in a real spiritual war. Paul says in verse 18, for many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. So many times before, Paul has warned the Philippian Christians about a group of people that he calls the enemies of the cross of Christ. Um, and he's not talking about like people who obviously hate and want to destroy Christianity. I mean, he's not talking about ISIS right now. We don't know the exact identity of this group, but they are people who are posing as authentic Christians, but were really leading people astray. It could be that he's talking about uh, a group that he's already mentioned earlier in this chapter. Uh, this group is called the, the Judaizers. Um, and they taught that you have to get circumcised, you basically have to keep the law of Moses in order to be saved. Jesus was a Jewish Messiah, so you have to convert to Judaism in order for Jesus to save you, which seems reasonable, but what it's saying is the cross of Jesus Christ is not enough to save you. You have to do good works too. Or, this group of people could be kind of on the other end of the spectrum. And Paul had to deal with this group in the letter to the Romans. These are people who took Paul's message of faith alone in Jesus Christ saves us, and they twisted it to say, Jesus died for our sins on the cross, all of our sins. So, as long as we believe in Jesus, we can live however it is we want to live. Let us sin so that grace may abound, is what they said. And it really drove Paul crazy. You read about it in Romans 6. He was very, very irritated with this group. Because both of these groups, both those who say that the cross isn't enough and those who say trivialize the cross and 
take Jesus for granted, both of these groups are distorting the gospel. And both of these mistakes are, are deadly. Uh, Paul goes on to describe them. Their end is destruction. Destruction is the opposite of salvation. These people who are distorting the gospel, they are going to face God's eternal judgment in hell. This is as serious as it gets. This isn't, you know, some guy sitting in a coffee shop arguing, oh, Calvinism, Arminianism, or like arguing over how to interpret Revelation. This is the very heart of the message of salvation through Christ. And these people are denying it. He goes on to say, their one God, their God isn't the one true God. Actually, their God is their belly, which seems kind of weird. But Paul, what Paul is saying is either they are obsessed with trying to get people to keep all the dietary restrictions in the law of Moses, like no pork, no shrimp, uh, because you have to keep the law of Moses to be saved, or they are obsessed with fulfilling their own physical desires. And whatever it is, they're, met, they're missing Jesus and denying the gospel. Their glory is in their shame. What the enemies of the cross are proud of, their false teaching is exactly what they should be ashamed of. They think they're going to receive glory from God on the last day, but they are instead going to be put to shame. And finally, this is critical. This is the one I want to pay most attention to. Paul says, they set their minds on earthly things. You've heard the phrase, well, you know, he makes mistakes, but his heart is in the right place. Right? So he has good intentions. His heart is in the right place. Paul is saying that of these people, that their heart is absolutely in the wrong place. Their focus is completely off. What's most valuable to them, whether that be worldly pleasure or, or gold stars or keeping the law or reputation or power, it isn't actually ultimately valuable <coughs> at all. It's, it's fool's gold. You know, you get, you get fool's gold. I think the first settlers of America, they <coughs> dug up the stuff that looked like gold. We struck it rich, this is awesome, and it turns out to be a, a, a compound known as pyrite, which looks like gold, but is absolutely worthless. What they put their trust and hope in looks valuable, but it is not. Setting their minds on earthly things is their root problem. This is what is making them distort the gospel, because they value something of this world more than they value Christ, whether that be pleasure, reputation, power, Whatever. Whatever it is, it's causing them to uh, engage in this kind of heresy. I want to clarify something. When Paul says, don't set your mind on earthly things, he doesn't mean never think about practical day-to-day -day things. Uh, Paul himself had a secular job. He was a tent maker. That's how he uh, earned his living and supported himself as he went from town to town sharing the gospel. So uh, living in this world means that we have to devote some of our time, sometimes a lot of our time, thinking about the things of this world. For example, on Thursday, uh, my, my phone was dying. It could no longer hold a charge, and I couldn't charge it. So I had like a few minutes left on my phone. So I'm like, okay, I need to replace my phone. And I needed to take something to Rachel at work. So I made a sharp right turn and punctured my tire. My tire's flat. I think this is great. So I got a lug wrench. And I'm like, ah! I'm like, I'm at, I really made those sound effects. I hope. Nobody knows how hard it's happening. But the, the lug nuts are not moving. Somebody used an air wrench to tighten them, so I had to get the thing towed. Some other things happened, so on and so forth. So I spent most of the day thinking about practical day-to-day -day stuff. I would much have rather preferred not to have done so, but that is what I did, because that's the kind of day I had. Everyone here will have that kind of day, and does, I know. Uh, that's not what Paul means by setting your minds on the things on this earth. What he means is being absorbed. Earth. Setting your mind on something means making it your ultimate goal. Paul is saying don't put your hope, your trust in anything of this world. Don't treat it like it's supremely important. Because all this stuff, all this stuff is going away. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7 that the present form of this world is passing away. This isn't nothing on this earth, nothing that this world considers valuable is going to last. Only Christ is. So how do we keep ourselves, as believers, from setting our minds on earthly things? By, I mean, we would never say that it is the most valuable thing in our lives, but by our words, our actions, our thoughts, the way that we spend our time, if you looked at that, then you would say, oh, well, maybe, maybe they do find things in this world to be the most valuable. How do we avoid that? Part of the 
the answer, of course, is, is practicing the spiritual disciplines, staying in the Word of God, reading the Word of God, meditating on it. Uh, part of it is praying, being in touch with God. But it's really hard to stay on track by yourself. Sometimes you might have to. There are extraordinary cases in which believers have to live the Christian life alone. Uh, and God gives grace where that grace is needed. That's not like the standard operating procedure. God intends for us to spend time with his I like what Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians. He talks about how uh, believers have the aroma of Christ, right? Which, which sounds weird, but uh, if you think about it, it really makes sense. You, sometimes you're around people who you can really just sense that they are in love with Christ, that they, have, they are full of the Spirit, the Spirit of Christ is at work in them. And what Paul is saying is go find people like that and imitate them. This was really big, I think in the 90s, maybe in the early 2000s. I used to have one, you know, a WWJD bracelet, right? And I wore it all the time. What would Jesus do? Right? And I mean, that's a, that's a very fine question to ask yourself. But another good question to ask yourself is, what would this godly mature person in my life, what would he do in this situation? How would she handle this? You might be thinking, for example, man, I the last month, I hardly spent any time with the Lord. I hardly spent any time reading. My, my devotional life is just stuck in a rut. But I know this other person here who just is so in touch with the Lord when they pray, it's just obvious that they spend so much time in prayer and have a close relationship with God. But what do they do? Like, how do they maintain that kind of walk with God while trying to take care of flat tires and whatever else? And go and talk uh, to that person. And uh, it doesn't mean that you, like, quit your job and follow that person around and be that person's, like, disciple for the next five years, but it does mean having a conversation with them, like, hey, can you teach me how to do this? That is one of the important ways that we stay on track in the Christian life. So, we need community so that we can avoid uh, setting our mind on the things of this earth, but also on the positive side so that we will keep our minds on the things of heaven. Paul says in verse 20, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Paul reminds the Philippians here that this world is not their home. And we need, we need this reminder, we need this reminder all the time. We get caught up in day-to-day -day stuff, and we forget that we are what the Apostle Peter calls strangers and exiles. We are not home. Our citizenship, Paul says, is in heaven. And Paul uses this word citizenship very intentionally. So the Philippians, we know from historical documents that the people of Philippi were very preoccupied with social standing, social status. And the way to get to the top of the social ladder was by being a Roman citizen. Not everybody who lived in the Roman Empire was a citizen of Rome. Actually, only a small minority of people living in the empire were considered citizens. And if you were a citizen, you got all kinds of special privileges. Uh, you could own property, you could vote, you could hold public office. Uh, the government could just throw you into jail for any reason they wanted to. You, you had to have a fair trial, and no matter how bad a crime you committed, you could not be executed by crucifixion. If you were a Roman citizen, they could not nail you to a cross. They would have to find other ways to execute you. So, um, there were all kinds of, of, of uh, privileges that came along with being a Roman citizen. The Apostle Paul, we know from the book of Acts, was himself a Roman citizen, and he was not afraid to uh, use his privileges sometimes. You know, the story of Acts 16, he's in Philippi, actually, gets thrown into prison for casting a demon out of a fortune-telling girl. Uh, and then there's the, the story about how the earthquake freed him, but he stayed behind, shared the gospel with the Philippian jailer, the jailer and his household all become believers in Christ. The next day, the, the, poli the local politicians in Philippi are like, oh, we done messed up. This guy was a Roman citizen, and we just throw him in jail without a trial. And if this gets back to Caesar, we are in trouble. So they actually like try to keep it hush-hush. They're like, okay, just get him out of there, and say anything about it. Paul's like, no, no, you guys got to come in person and apologize before I leave. So they do. 
And uh, it's, it's, it's pretty funny. And that's not the only time in the book of Acts where Paul uses his rights as a Roman citizen uh, to advance the gospel even. But Paul is saying, speaking as a Roman citizen, remember, your citizenship isn't ultimately in Philippi, it's not in Rome, it's not in Trenton, it's not ultimately in the United States of America or any other place on earth. It is our heaven, our, but it is rather in heaven. Christ is our ultimate allegiance and our ultimate goal. Amen. A way that it's said a lot, and I like the way this is put, is that we, are, we have dual citizenship. Right? We are citizens of this earth, specifically the United States of America, but also heaven. Paul says, be good earthly citizens. You know, he talks about this in Romans 13. Keep the law. Right? Be, be good citizens. Work for the good of the earthly country that you find yourself in. But one of our citizenships takes precedence over the other because it is in heaven where our true hope lies. This world isn't, this world isn't the energizer bunny. Right? It's not going to keep going and going. It's going somewhere, and that somewhere is that Christ is, is when Christ returns and makes all things new. Creation, Romans 8 tells us, is subjected to futility. It means that things happen that just seem completely random and completely pointless. Hurricanes, tornadoes, lightning might strike your church. And rather than saying, oh man, what did they do to have that happen? I mean, this we live in a fallen world. Things like this happen. Uh, the weather is, is messed up. Geography uh, is, is messed up. And that includes our own bodies. Our bodies get diseases. They have genetic disorders. They break down. Uh, even if they function perfectly for decades and decades, they will get old. They will break down. I am 28 years old, and the other day I woke up with a really bad, bad backache. I'm like, what the heck? I'm 28. But it happened. And here I am. Like my back's this, is, this is the most ridiculous thing in the world. Why? Because our bodies break down. Also, I need to exercise more. That's not the point. All right. Creation is subjected to futility, but Paul's message here is that Christ will return. And he will make all things new, and that includes our bodies. He will perform our lowly, broken, frail bodies into his resurrection body, which we don't know what that's going to be like, but we do know it's going to be exactly the way that God intended humanity to be. And it is not going to be sin, and it's not going to decay, there isn't going to be there isn't going to be type 1 diabetes or cancer or anything else. Christ is going to, to, to deal with all of that. Paul's saying that no, no government can ultimately save us. He's also saying that no accomplishment, no relationship can ultimately fulfill us. Our hope is in the resurrected Christ. There are forces out there, there are dark forces, uh, the prince of the power of the air, the principalities, they are out there trying to distract us from that truth. They're trying, to, they're trying to set our minds and our hopes and our values to this world. What Paul is telling us is that we as the people of God, we need to band together, come together as, as Christ people, and to stay focused on our Lord and Savior like to ask for the, the praise team at this point. You may have, uh, you may have heard the phrase that uh, Christians are in this world, but they are not of this world. Um, that's a pretty good summary of what Jesus is, is praying in John chapter 17. He says, I'm not praying that you take my, my disciples out of this world, uh, but that you protect them from the evil one. For they, my disciples, are not of this world. It's also a good summary of what Paul is teaching us here in Philippians 3. It's a hard balance for us as Christians to get right. We are not called upon to withdraw from the world. Um, we're not called upon to renounce our, our citizenship as Americans or any other earthly country. You know, we are supposed to work for the good of our, of our country, of our community. But we cannot share in the values and the mindset of this world when it conflicts with what God has revealed to us through Scripture. Our primary citizenship is... Our default setting, I think, even as believers, is to, and of course we would never say this, but we get like this. We live like this world is really all that there is. How do we, and, and, and the question here is, how do we keep that from, from happening? There's all sorts of ways, but one really important aspect, Paul says, is to be in fellowship with other believers, especially to have the example of mature Christians, those who have been in Christ for a long time and who display the fruit of the Spirit. Um, we're, gonna, we're going to uh, we're going to 
sing um, I Decided to, uh, to Follow Jesus, which is a song about, about setting our face to pursuing Christ, even though there are things out there that are trying to distract us. And as we sing this song, um, I'm going to be down here in front. And if you're here today and you're thinking, man, my citizenship is not in heaven because I'm not, I'm not trusting in Jesus. I'm trusting in myself. I'm trusting in my own good works. I'm trusting in these other things. Uh, I encourage you, like, put those things, put those things aside. Your, your good works, your good works are not enough. There's nothing on the, in this earth that you can do <laughs> hope in that's going to fulfill you. Turn to Christ. He gives you hope and joy. He gives you Himself freely. And I'll be up here in front, and I'd be more than happy to talk to you and pray with you. If you are a Christian, if you are, have, if you are a citizen of heaven, but you're thinking, man, I'm not living that way. I'm setting my mind on earthly things way too much. Uh, take that to take that to the Lord and do and do business with them today. If you would like me to pray with you, I would be very very happy to do that as well. So let's go to the Lord and pray, and then we'll sing. I decided to follow Jesus. Jesus, uh, we do eagerly await for you. Uh, we know that this world is not all that there is. That is not going to keep going on forever and ever the way that it is. But one day you're going to return, and you are going to make all things new. That is our hope. I pray that we would live. Inspires us and motivates us uh, through life. We pray this in Christ's name.